Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The title of this presentation is So That We May Be Like Other Nations, uh, which is a quote from the book of Samuel. Um, and the subtitle, my very seminary subtitle, is The Politics of Ambivalence in the Book of Samuel. How do you like that? Um, but the clickbait version of this, type, of this title is, you won't believe what this biblical book has to say about the 2016 U.S. presidential election. <laughs> we'll come back to clickbait in just a, just a little bit. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to start uh, over here at Independence Hall downtown. Um, so, as you probably know, in 1787, the representatives who gathered at Federal Hall, it wasn't Independence Hall at this point, or wasn't called Independence Hall at this point, uh, in Philadelphia were charged with a monumental task. Uh, they were to reform this government that had basically been ineffectual for almost a decade under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, they agreed that the federal government had to be strengthened in some way. And most argued that the best way to accomplish this was to design a government with a strong executive. Now, you can imagine what the concern was. Um, uh, it was surprising because of this guy. Um, that's George III, looking foppish as ever. Um, but uh, much of the founders' opposition to George III um, could be traced to their belief that the British monarch had abused his considerable power. This influenced the conversations about their strength, the strength of the American executive. Um, in light of their native fear of royal absolutism, the framers of the Constitution were de determined to avoid a monarchy at all costs. George Washington was, the, was observing all of these proceedings. Uh, to say that George Washington was well respected in the early days of the Republic would be a colossal understatement. And when I say colossal, I mean colossal. It was a huge understatement. Mm -hmm. even. Uh, well, even as the delegates to the Constitutional Convention discussed this hypothetical executive whose power was limited, who had checks and balances, <laughs> and all this stuff, they knew that at least the first president would become nothing less than an American monarch. He would basically, uh, as, as uh, um, Washington set off from Mount Vernon to assume the presidency, uh, his friend James McHenry told him, you are now a king under a different name. But he was also staggered by the adulation of his people, and he was also deeply concerned about their expectations of him. This is a quote um, from him. I greatly apprehend that my countrymen will expect too much from me. I fear if the issue of public measures should not correspond with their sanguine expectations, they will turn the extravagant praises which they are heaping upon me at this moment into equally extravagant censures. Washington recognized that no human being could possibly, possibly be everything that the American people hoped for. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the people of the new nation made George Washington the vessel for their hopes and dreams. The American people were so eager to locate their hopes in one person that they were willing to jeopardize their grand experiment in self-government. <laughs> and um, this desire for a king is nothing new. It's also central to the biblical narrative. Um, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit now. Um, because the best example of this occurs in the book of Samuel. The pivotal scene in the book is it's almost boring and easy to, easy to overlook if you're just reading through. Uh, it begins in chapter um, 8, 9, nine. Um, when in his old age, Samuel appoints his sons as judges over Israel. Um, and though Israel had been governed by judges since the death of Joshua, the elders of the people were ready for a change. They approached Samuel and they said, uh, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. Um, now, the elders were anxious about the direction of their nation and hungry for change, not an entirely unfamiliar uh, sentiment. Uh, but despite Samuel's comprehensive catalog of the perils of monarchy, the people are, of Israel are adamant. Um, no, they say, but we are determined to have a king over us. 
so that we may also be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Notice what's going on here, and I think it's really interesting and really indicted in some ways. Their logic is almost paradoxical. Israel, Israel wants a king to save them from their enemies, but they also want a king so that they will be like their enemies. The Philistines have a king, the, um, the uh, Amalekites have a king, the people over here have a king, the people over here have a king. They seem to be doing really well, so why can't we have a king too? I think that that's what we need right now. It's much more than a political preference that they're expressing. It's actually the ultimate act of idolatry. And idolatry is the number one sin in the Bible that you're not allowed to, that, well, not allowed to do any of the sins, but the, the, uh, idolatry is the number one sin. It's the one that, it's the one that uh, uh, leads to all of the other sins. Um, the Lord says as much when Samuel prays in frustration. Samuel is, he's like, oh, man, this, what do you mean? You don't want judges anymore. You don't want, you want a king? That's, that's frustrating. He prays, he says, what, what, what's going on with your people, Lord? And the Lord's response is powerful. Listen to, your voice, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, he says. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Israel would rather put their lives in the hands of a human being than trust in the God who redeemed them from slavery. Israel's desire for a king signals a fundamental change in its identity, from those who have been chosen by God to those who choose a God for themselves. And that's a totally, that's a, that's a complete uh, turnaround, a complete 180. Their determination, in other words, their determination to have a king led them to forget who they were. Which brings us to this. Oh. Oh. I feel like I should have had a trigger warning for before I had uh, <laughs> One of the complicating factors of this election, even more so than their, um, the unpopularity of the, the major, can major party's nominees, is that many people have invested all of their hopes in their chosen candidate. This is the person who's going to figure it out for us. Um, now this is always the case to some extent. There's no question about that. I think every every year, we every four years, we see someone say, "Oh, this is this this is it. This is the this is the one person who can who can figure it out." And that if you choose the other person, we're 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 done. Um, um, but 2016 has charted new territory. Um, we've moved from which candidate would you rather have a beer with, um, which was sort of the the ultimate question about 16 years ago, um, to which quest, which candidate would you trust with your very sense of self? <laughs> Not since the early days of the Republic has the line been b between electing a chief executive and anointing a monarch been so very faint. Um, but whereas George Washington was exceedingly apprehensive about his countrymen's desire for a king, um, both campaigns this year have been pretty cavalier about it. Um, and uh, one candidate in particular has enthusiastically embraced this desire for a king. At the Republican National Convention, remember, the nominee announced that he alone could solve the problems facing our nation as he declared, I am your voice. I didn't pull up the... Yes. Um, I'm just Save your comments, please. Save your comments. Um, and though the Democratic candidate has been um, uh, more circumspect in this regard, um, the fact is that her entire campaign, through all of the primaries and through the general election, has, been, has hinged on the idea that she is the only option the only viable option, and you know, the, the only person who could possibly uh, uh, be elected to this role office is, is, uh, is her. Um, uh, in so many ways, the nominees have come to embody the hopes, dreams, and frustrations of the American people. For many, including the candidates themselves, the people running in this presidential election have become the agents who will rescue us from despair and uncertainty. Um, in other words, we're so eager to put our trust in these presidential candidates that we are at risk of forgetting who we are. Um, and this raises several problematic questions for us as Americans, but more importantly for us as people of faith. 
The first question is pure, a purely practical one. <coughs> if the one person who can <coughs> solve our problems fails, where are we supposed to turn then? This is a fairly, uh, it's a straightforward question, but it's one that's worth, one that's worth asking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the second question is this. Um, one of the hallmarks of our constitutional republic is that we are not governed by an individual or even by a group of individuals, um, but by a system of laws. Um, so what does it mean for us to associate the future of our country not with that system, but with a particular personality? Um, and the third question is, comes from the perspective of, of our faith. Christian faith teaches that we cannot ultimately locate our hope in any human being, in any mortal. What happens when, in our eagerness to support our chosen candidate, we fail to remember that God is the sole source of our life and salvation? 